All right, the role of nat- national Israel in God's plan of the ages. Um, so <laughs> we're going to do a little detour today, but I, I, that's okay. I think you'll enjoy it. I hope, I, I know I have. So no one really disputes that, um, I, I mean, from the different theological perspectives, that Israel was intended to serve as a living object lesson of how God deals with his chosen people. I think everyone agrees on that. The question comes when we look at the two major failures of the nation of Israel and the consequences of those failures. There's two, really two major times when Israel failed. And, and of course, the, the actual destruction of Jerusalem is just the culmination of that, right? So the first failure, I say, is 586 B.C. when uh, Nebuchadnezzar... It, it was as if the children of Israel just could not really believe that God would ever allow his city to fall. I mean, this is the first time in 800 years that the nation of Israel is out of their land, is, is, is put out. So I think that was, just, and that really, we need to keep that in mind when we read like Ezekiel and, and, and the prophecies that come right after, the prophets like Zechariah that we'll look at today. We need to put ourselves in the perspective of a nation that for 800 years had been, God said, this is your land, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to take care of you, and they've been kicked out, Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed, they just could not get their mind wrapped around what had happened. And so we, when we read those prophets, Ezekiel and, and Zechariah and others, we need to remi- remember the situation of those who first heard those prophecies and read them. So that first failure, 586 B.C., but then, then God started bringing the people back, didn't He? And it was really pretty quickly that He started bringing them back, after 70 years, really. Uh, 520 B.C., really, we see Israel coming back already. But then they're in the land leading up to the time of Jesus coming to the earth, and then there's a second failure, isn't there? What was that failure? They failed to recognize their Messiah. And that ends up in what happens in 70 A.D. when the Roman came in and destroyed the, the uh, city of Jerusalem. And depending on who you read, if you read Josephus' account, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Jewish people were killed, maybe as many as a million. I mean, it was, a, it was horrible what took place. And, so, um, and the rest were kicked out. And so we see this second failure. So now the question is, or for everyone after that, who look at the Bible and look at these Old Testament prophecies is, well, when Israel is completely obliterated for the second time and not in their land, how can these prophecies about Israel back in the land be true? I mean, it it, it sure looks like maybe uh, maybe it's not going to be literally fulfilled. And so really down through the ages since this second failure, uh, Bible scholars, many of them whom have come to just kind of figure that, wow, Israel, God's done with Israel, and maybe he's replaced Israel with um, the church, with Christians. And you can see how people might come up with that idea as a way of harmonizing the realities of their world with these Old Testament prophecies. So um, it's really kind of interesting because from 70 AD all the way down until at least the 18th century and into the 19th century when the modern Zionist movement began to, to happen, and suddenly there began, no, suddenly is the wrong word, gradually <laughs> there began to be this movement back towards the land after so many years of not being a nation. And um, I think for a lot of people it was just kind of a curiosity, how could this happen and again, for many people who had already adopted a theological pers- persuasion that said these, these prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about Israel and David reigning in Israel, they must be allegorical. They must be referring to a, a spiritual reign. And then you start to see Israel coming back to the land and you kind of scratch your head saying, well, hmm, is there any necessity for God to still work with his chosen people Israel? Or is it all, has he all done? Is there, is there a, from the prophecies we read, is there a necessity for God to still work with them? Or is it acceptable to um, say, well, it, you know, no, there's, it, it, he's not going to work with Israel anymore. Now, this is where dispensationalism greatly differs from Reformed theology. 
And, and again, our desire is not to defend one theological position against another. That's not it. Our desire is to see what Scripture tells us and to do our best to interpret it a- accurately. And of course, Reformed theologians would say they're doing that. And I, I wouldn't disagree with them. They're doing their best to do that. However, what really separates, and, and you know, I listened to, to Dr. Sproul say that what separates us is our view of eschatology, of what's coming in the future. I don't see that as basically what separates us. I see that as the, as the, the result of what separates. What separates us is how we interpret the Old Testament prophecies. That's where it really boils down to. And as dispensationalists, we look at the Old Testament prophecies and we say, you know what, we need to take them the same way that we take the rest of Old Testament literature. We don't see that because it's a prophetic passage that we then have license to interpret it our own way. Okay, And, and I think I, I want to illustrate that today from the book of Zechariah and show why some of the prophecies, even Reformed theologians take literally. But others, they take figuratively. How, what justifies that change? So the Reformed theologians are required by their theology to allegorize some of those Old Testament prophecies. And that's, that's where we have a point of difference. Okay, so without being in a bashing mode, I just want us to... to so this is what we looked at last week, the role of national Israel in God's plan, seeing that God really, even though He called Abraham, it was 430 years before... Abraham's descendants really became a nation. And that's when they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Sinai Peninsula, they crossed through the Red Sea, and they are at Mount Sinai for around a year being oriented by the Lord, and God makes a covenant with them. So that's really when the nation forms. And then at the possession of the land, another 40 years later, when they're getting ready to go into the land, we have a whole body of truth, especially the book of Deuteronomy and all that's there of God communicating to His people and preparing them for what's going to happen and also preparing them for when they, before they ever go in. Now, when you disobey, this is what's going to happen. And as we saw last week in the one passage in Deuteronomy, he seems to describe two separate being cast out of the land two different times. And then at the first coming of Christ, we see the nation of Israel coming back into their land after being kicked out. They're coming back into the land and a lot of messianic hope at that time, right? Okay, so that's, that's what we looked at last week. Now, I want to take a little, I guess you could call it a detour, but it's a scenic detour. Did you ever do a, you know, a, you're going from A to B and you're doing a long road trip and, and then there's this little scenic detour on the side and sometimes those scenic detours are really, really nice. Well, this is going to be kind of a scenic, panoramic, uh, prophetic detour of national Israel and it comes from the book of Zechariah. But before we go to Zechariah, I just want to illustrate a principle. Many times the prophecies in the Old Testament, you have a statement made about what's going to happen. And when you read it, it doesn't mean that it's automatically going to tell you everything that's going to happen so that when you read the prophecy, you're going to, you can say, before it happens, you can say, oh, it's going to happen like this, 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 and this. Right? Think of the disciples. How many times did they do things like going to get the donkey for Jesus to ride on? And they had no idea that they were fulfilling prophecy until afterwards. And they go, oh, we just did what, we just fulfilled prophecy. And that happened over and over, right, during the time of Jesus. So many times these prophecies were given in such a way that afterwards you look at it and you go, oh, that's exactly what, it's, what it meant. But before, you couldn't tell. For example, Psalm 22. So it's a psalm of David. Many times the Messianic psalms are from David. And he starts out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, what does that call to your mind immediately? Yeah, our Savior on the cross. That's exactly the words of Jesus on the cross. So did David, when he wrote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did he have an image of Jesus hanging on a cross? I don't think so. And the readers certainly didn't see that. And you say, well, well, Jesus, knowing that David had written that, simply used those words, so that's kind of cheating to say that that's a fulfillment. But wait a minute, let's look at a little bit more of what Psalm 22 says. So he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I believe that Jesus quoted those words so that we would look again at Psalm 22 and find out some of the other things that are there that were fulfilled literally at his crucifixion. Verse 7 and 8, all those who 
see me, ridicule me, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him since he delights in him. So David, writing a thousand years or almost a thousand years before Jesus' crucifixion, writes in this psalm and he puts this phrase in there. They, the, the, that the people who ridicule him are saying this about him. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. So Jesus could look at the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Memorize it and say it from the cross. But when you're on the cross, can you get your enemies to repeat a prophetic passage that's referring to you? Can you get them to do that too? That's what happens here, right? Right? Because in Matthew 27, we read these words. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. It's almost an exact quote from Psalm 22. So David, when, when he wrote Psalm 22, again, did he see Jesus hanging on the cross? We have no evidence that he did. And the people who read Psalm 22, did they have any idea of what that, how that would be fulfilled? No. So what should that teach us? What should that teach us when it comes to interpreting prophecy? We don't see the end game. And just because we see the prophecy and we read the details and we say, well, that's never happened, that doesn't mean we should just scratch it off and say it's not going to happen. It means we better wait and see. <laughs> It could still be coming. All right, there's a little bit more in this Psalm 22 that's so interesting. So he says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. So on a cross, one of the things that was very common was it would just dry them out to where they're just dried up. And my tongue clings to my jaws. Remember, they put a, a sponge and put some uh, vinegar on it and, and to, to wet their... Not as if it would help, because it wouldn't. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. Well, that's a common reference in Judaism too. Gentiles. And the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, I have no idea what David was describing when he wrote those words, but he wasn't being crucified, was he? Crucifixion was a Roman torture that wasn't invented for another 800 years. <laughs> so when Jesus says, or when, when David says, they pierced my hands and my feet, he's not talking about being crucified. And yet, can we see the crucifixion in those words? Yeah. And I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. If you think about it, our head is made to be held up straight, right? If you have to go around like this, because the cross would not allow you to put your head in the normal position, it wouldn't take very long and you, you couldn't hold it up anymore because you're, and so pretty soon you're just looking at yourself. The description is uncanny. It is amazing. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. We all know what that's referring to. That comes, that's, that, that was perfectly fulfilled in our Savior on the cross. And yet, if you read that psalm, I think the majority of us would realize it's talking about something, but, but in, unless we knew about the crucifixion, I don't think we would even envision a crucifixion. And I think that that is a, a, a good learning paradigm for us to realize that um, prophecy in the, in the Old Testament was given for the purpose that after it was fulfilled, you could look back and say, you know what, that's exactly what the prophet said. And here is the reason why. Jesus said, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. This is the night before the crucifixion. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes. Why? So that you can know exactly what's coming? No, because they didn't figure it out, did they? Even Jesus telling them that he would be crucified and raise, rise again on the third day, they didn't get it. It wasn't with the intention that they would be able to say, oh, oh, don't panic, you know, he's going to rise again. Is it didn't have that effect. No. He says, I have told you before it comes so that when it does come to pass, then you'll believe. Ah. So the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament don't necessarily give us a roadmap of everything that's going to happen. 
But in fact, their intention in, in most cases is so that after it's been fulfilled, we look back and say, oh, oh my goodness, he even said it would be the colt, the foal of a donkey. It wasn't just the donkey. He even said, the prophet even said that. And so the fulfillment is when the understanding comes that we've done it. So then prophecy should not be looked at as a roadmap to tell us everything that's going to happen before it happens but rather an indication of God's sovereign moving and and fulfilling His Word. So we want to go to Zechariah. Zechariah was was, the prophet Zechariah was a priest. He had been born in Babylon in the captivity. And he, early in his life and ministry, he's one of the first ones to come back to Jerusalem. All right? And so he, he is going back to Jerusalem and he and, and prophesied to, or to rebuild and repopulate the, the temple and, and Jerusalem. So he prophesies about the return to the land. And Zechariah writes, I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them, and they shall increase as they once increased. I will sow them among the peoples. This is the first stage. I'm going to plant them among the peoples and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. All right? Now we have a problem because we start to ask ourselves, well, which time is this him bringing them back? Because Zechariah wrote in 520 B.C., more or less. So is he writing about the first return leading up to the time of Jesus? Or is he, is he referring to a future one? Well, it's a little hard to tell from that. In some ways, it looks like the, the future one because they're bringing him back. From all, he doesn't even mention Babylon, which he himself was born there. So I think he knew about Babylon. And yet we don't know for sure just by those words. So what we're looking for is some sort of a a sign, a time, something in time that tells us clearly when things happen. So I made this little graphic to hopefully... Hello? Oh. Well, I don't know why it's... I must... What am I doing wrong here? Anyway. so, So down here at this end... You can see when Jerusalem is destroyed and about 70 years later, Zechariah is called to, to be one of the first to go back to Jerusalem and they get the degree, decree to rebuild the temple. And you have all of those 400 and some years in between before the time of Jesus' birth and then the crucifixion and then the destruction. So the question is, but we see that then that the people of the nation of Israel, national Israel, is exiled in 586 B.C., but there's also that second failure, and they're exiled again in 70 A.D. So we want to say, well, now what part is he talking about? Okay, Is there something in what he tells us in his prophecy that helps us to nail down what part is he referring to? Okay, So we get to Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. And we read, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now, if we knew nothing about what took place at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, we would scratch our heads on that one, wouldn't we? What is that all about? What is this? What is he describing here? But because we know from the Gospels what took place, then we can say, oh, I know what that's talking about. What is it talking about? Judas Iscariot, right? Okay, so we, we right away, we recognize, and even the 30 pieces of silver, okay? So we see that and we understand. We go to Matthew 27. If I turn this back on. Matthew 27, 3 to 7, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he, Jesus, had been condemned, was remorseful, and this is after the crucifixion, and he brought back how many pieces of silver? Same amount, 30 pieces of silver, to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple 
and departed and went and hanged himself. Then I said to them, oh, I went the wrong way. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. So here we have a fulfillment that you could not make this up, how perfectly this fulfills. And yet, when you go back and look at what uh, what Zechariah wrote, you you wouldn't be able to to say in advance, well, this is how it's going to work. And yet, once you see it, that it happened. I mean, the fact that he says, I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter? Why would you throw them into the house of the Lord for the potter? And yet, that's exactly what was fulfilled when when, uh, Judas threw the money into the house of the Lord because he was remorseful. And then they said, well, we can't keep it, so let's buy the potter's field. They didn't realize either. They were perfectly fulfilling the prophecy. What an amazing thing. So again, we we need to learn from this. The prophecies are not given so that we can predict everything precisely as as it's going to happen, right? The prophecy is given to us so that afterwards we go, wow, wow, look what God did. He fulfilled that perfectly. And that's exactly what we see in this illustration. Okay, so that that point in in, uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, is clearly identified with what happened at the crucifixion, right? I mean, there's no denying. It's talking about the same thing. 30 pieces of silver, throw it into the temple, goes to the potter. Wow, so that's an exact match. Time-wise, so we know that's what that chapter is talking, that point is talking about. So from there, we can either go a little bit backwards or a little bit forwards and hopefully have our, our chronometer marked. Okay, we start with a fixed point. And so let's back up a few verses and look at what we see about national Israel from this panoramic view from Zechariah the prophet. So we back up just a few verses, to verse 4 through 6. Thus says the Lord my God, Feed the flock for slaughter. Now, the first thing is, is the flock. What would the flock be, do you suppose? Feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. And, And... we want to be careful. Our desire is to, to interpret as literally as possible. And we have seen all through the book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah used the word shepherd, he was referring to the leaders. Huh? Yeah, he was referring to both kings, both the kings and the, the religious leaders of the people, and even prophets. And so, so when we see that, in the context of the, of the prophecies, we believe that that's probably referring to the same things, talking about the, the religious leaders or the leaders of the people. And so in the context of leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, which just comes four verses later, right, in, in this chapter, so we see that the, the prophecy says, feed the flock for slaughter. The flo- flock is referring to the nation of Israel. Feed them for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them, whose owners slaughter them, the the leaders, and feel no guilt for those who sell them. Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. That was exactly the situation of the religious leaders in Israel at the time of Christ. They could not be bothered with him because he was messing up their prosperity. That's what he was... was they They were sitting pretty. They didn't want him messing that up. Remember, they said, well, we we can't let him keep on doing these miracles or the Romans are going to come and take away our place. See, they were worried about their own greed. And that's described right there in Zechariah. So, the Lord says, I'm not going to have pity any longer for the inhabitants of the land, but indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land and I will not deliver them from their hand. See, the Lord been protecting them. Even when we don't know it. Do you know, sometimes I think we take for granted, we forget that God's watching over us. I think sometimes we take for granted how much God is looking, looking out for us. That would be a big mistake to forget, wouldn't it? To underappreciate God's care for us. So he goes on. Again, 
So I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. And you think about Jesus' ministry. It was primarily for the people in Galilee, and, and it, was, it wasn't so much for the religious leaders. They rejected him. I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs. One I called beauty, and the other I called bonds. Now, are we allowed to just make these mean anything we want? No. Okay, so, so the, 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 the language of the text should guide us. And yet at this point, we don't know what this means. All right, but that doesn't give us the right to make up our own meaning. We're just patient and wait on it and say, okay, where's this going to go? So he says, um, I took myself two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. Wow, what does that mean? And then he says, my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. What do you suppose that's referring to? How was the relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees, priests, and, and the, and the uh, scribes? Well, that's a pretty good description. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Right? And, and he says, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. So, Many Bible scholars believe that the three shepherds is a reference to the three offices of, of uh, the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month, probably referring to what took place in 70 AD when they got canceled. And by the way, they have never, never come back to what they were previously. Now, we run into people all over the world with the name Levine, Levine or Levin or with, that, that we know are from the priestly line, right? Um, and, and from the tribe of Levi, at least. And we run into uh, those Jewish descendants, but up until this point, there is no... I mean, there are those that are trying to reestablish the priesthood, but it, ain't, it hasn't happened yet. So in 2,000 years, he dismissed the three shepherds in one month. All right, then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. Ooh. Well, we need to understand that Zechariah, when Zechariah wrote this, the, the siege against Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar was 70 years in the past. He's not talking about that siege against Jerusalem, is he? There's only one other time when this happened in Jerusalem. It's during the Roman siege in 70 A.D. And they did, literally, there were those who were resorting to cannibalism during the siege at that time, okay? So when you see these words, you can kind of put the pieces together and tie the timeline and say, okay, that's talking about, that's talking about 70 A.D. Zechariah, I mean, there's no other time for this to happen that he's aware of. Or possibly it could refer to even way in the future that we haven't gotten to yet, but most likely it's referring to 70 A.D., all right? So we see this timeline. Yes, Julie? Why don't you turn on your, turn on your microphone, then we can hear you. Yeah, it's on. Could it also refer to what happened to them? It, it's, it's, it's probably not because it has the feeling of, of prophetic. And I realize that in Hebrew you don't have the present future tense, but this is in the context, again, of, of what we just read about Jesus when when he was uh, crucified? I'm just thinking of the times where prophecy gives us yes. two times. Or, yes, you know. yes, yes. But, it, it's, but, but again, this would not be a prophecy. Normally the prophecy doesn't go backwards. Yeah. Normally the prophecies go forward, although I, I don't want to get totally dogmatic, and I think sometimes we make a mistake by doing that. But I do believe this is referring to probably, and it's not just me, it's people eminently more qualified than myself, probably leading, pointing forward to um, the time of the destruction in 70 AD. All right? So let's just continue here. Zechariah 11, 10 and 11. So we're talking in the basic time frame of when the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah. He says, And I took my staff, beauty... Oh, now we're going back to the staff thing. I took my staff, beauty, and cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I had made with Abraham... No, with all peoples. What covenant would that be that he made with all peoples? Well, I suspect, and, and good Bible scholars also believe that it's referring to the covenant God made with the nations to keep your hands off my, my people. 
when, 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 when the Assyrians took out Samaria and when Nebuchadnezzar took out Babylon, they were specifically tools in the hand of God. Were they not? Yes, they were. In fact, God chastised those nations eventually because they went too far. You, you, you took this, you, you, I, I wanted you to bring chastisement, you took it too far, and so God bring, brought chastisement on them. And so they were instruments in the hand of God, but no one was allowed to touch God's chosen people except when God said. This is very interesting because um, having lived in a, in, a, in a country where there's a great deal of spiritism and witchcraft pa- practice, you very quickly find out that the demons if they're asked to put a curse on a Christian and they, and they didn't know it and they go to do it and they find out it's a Christian, they come back on the person that asked and they, they whang them. That is not a, a light thing. In other words, a child of God has special protection even today. God does not just allow people to randomly attack the child of God, especially when we're walking in fellowship with Him. So, so we see that very same thing, only he says now, he says, I'm breaking the covenant that I had with those peoples, so it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord because they're going to see Jerusalem destroyed. They don't know it yet, but they're going to see it destroyed right before their very eyes. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now, again, when this was written, you could, I just, well, even, even when it happened, the religious leaders who had read Zechariah many times didn't realize they were fulfilling the prophecy. Okay, their minds were blinded to it. They didn't realize it. Just as Jesus' own disciples over and over didn't realize they were fulfilling prophecies. So again, the prophecy wasn't given so you could forecast what's going to happen. Um, but after the fulfillment, you can look back. Now, let me ask you something. Is this prophetic genre of Scripture? Is this prophecy? Yes. Remember that one of the uh, arguments that was made by, I think, by Sproul was that when you get to prophetic genre of Scripture, it, allo- it, it, it requires you to have an allegorical interpretation because it's prophetic genre. But if we have prophetic genre, like this clearly is, and it was literally fulfilled, then what does that say about the prophetic verse right next to it that hasn't been fulfilled? Does it allow us to say, oh, there's a change. Now he's saying we can interpret differently? I don't see that. I just... I. I cannot see how that can be, can be. It sure seems to me that the more logical explanation is that if he prophesied this and it was fulfilled at the time of Christ, literally, and then he prophesied this but it hasn't yet been fulfilled, it's because it hasn't yet been fulfilled. It just, it just We haven't seen it, it just hasn't happened yet. Ah, that's a little different way of looking at it. Then I cut into my other staff, bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Well, that's interesting. So the first staff he called beauty, and that had to do with protecting the people of Israel from the nations. And then the second staff was called bonds because it had to do with holding together in Judah and Israel. Now think about it. 722 B.C., Israel carted off by Assyria in the captivity. They're totally a separate nation from Judah. Now, I mean, they were at war with each other, remember? They'd been killing each other. And... So then Judah, 586 B.C., Jerusalem falls to Nebuchadnezzar, and they go into captivity. And during the interval between then and the time of Christ, the first century, both of some of these people come back together. And whether they understood it or not, God held them together with His staff called bonds. But when they come to the point of rejecting their Messiah... The Messiah breaks that staff called bonds and says, fine, you guys want to fight it out? You don't even realize I've been protect. I've been giving you unity and harmony to work together. And you know, as soon as that happened, after the crucifixion of Christ, it wasn't too many years before the peoples of Judah and the peoples of Israel began to fight. And by the time of the Roman invasion in 70 AD, they were killing each other. 
And there's some commentators or some historians from the period who said that they were killing each other almost as bad as the Romans were killing them. So when, when you see this description, you're going, oh my goodness, that is, that is exactly what happened at that time when they rejected their Messiah. Now we come to the very next verse, or just shortly thereafter, and the Lord said to me, next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. Okay, now shepherds were what? Leaders, and primarily the religious leaders. And now the prophet refers to a foolish shepherd, and then he calls him the worthless shepherd. So, this is, now this, by the way it's described, next take for yourself, it's, it, it implies that it's coming later, it's coming subsequent to. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces, in other words, he's going to be totally self-seeking. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. And so right away we're saying, well, who is this worthless shepherd? This, this uh, foolish shepherd. And then it says, a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Now, we could try and make up an allegorical interpretation of what this means, but I think we'd be making a mistake. I suspect, and, and again, uh, eminent Bible scholars believe that the worthless shepherd is referring forward to the Antichrist. And so we see this reference, a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. And I look at my MacArthur study Bible and he says the, the eye has to do with, with um, information and knowledge and the right arm has to do with strength. And many times, symbolically it does. But as I look at that, I can't help but wonder if this Antichrist, we know he's going to have a, a, a head wound that will be healed. I can't help but wonder if, if maybe it's going to involve a stroke or something and it shuts down the right side of his body and his right arm withers and his right eye totally, I don't know. I don't think I have to know. I don't think I have to have the answer because when it's fulfilled, people are going to look back and say, that's exactly what Zechariah said. All right? So th th that's the really nice part about a, a literal interpretation of these scriptures is we don't have to have an answer in every single part. If it's prophetic, it, maybe it just hasn't been fulfilled yet. All right? So what did I do? What happened? Oh. Okay. So. Ah. Uh, okay. So in this context. Okay. So, so what comes right after chapter 12? The burden of the word of the Lord. You see why I'm calling it a panorama? It's like it takes us from Zechariah's day to time of Christ on his first coming. And now it seems to be taking us forward to a future time that has not yet happened. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Now right away, remember where we are, Zechariah is prophesying. The Babylonian siege is 70 years in the rearview mirror. He's not talking about that. He's talking about something future. So we assume he's talking about 70 AD because there's going to be a siege in 70 AD, right? We, that's what we assume. But wait a minute. There's something about the description here that doesn't fit 70 AD. First of all, he says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. Well, in 70 AD, it wasn't a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. It was a pain in the neck for Rome, but they took them out. But let's just go a little further and see what, what other description is here, because it is a siege that will be coming against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah's time, he's looking forward. 
that does not fit what happened in 70 AD because no one was cut in pieces for taking out Rome. I mean, for taking out Jerusalem. So what could that be referring to? Do we then, are we forced to take it allegorically or is it possible it's referring to something that's still future? Now, here's the interesting thing. In 70 AD, the city's destroyed, the Jews are kicked out, there's no more nation. So how will Jerusalem be a heavy stone for all peoples? Because for 1,900 years, there was no Jerusalem that had Jews in it, basically. So in other words, in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled, the Jewish people have to be back in their land and back in control in Jerusalem. And guess what? We're standing on the ground the, time, the very time when this is finally coming to fruition. It couldn't be, come to fruition until you have Israel back in their land. Oh. And he says, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Now, when, when in 1948, when they first uh, declared themselves a nation, <laughs> they were such a heavy stone, they thought they themselves were going to sink. <laughs> and everybody prophesied, these guys are not going to last. We're gonna... And by the way, what was it that the, the surrounding nations said that they were going to do with Israel? They were, going to he they were going to push them into the sea. Well, Zechariah calls it, heave it away. The nations, he says, they're going to be a heavy stone for all the peoples, all who would heave it away. And it's interesting that right now, for the first time, from the Abraham Accords signed under Donald Tr President Donald Trump, that for the first time, many of the Arab nations have finally decided it doesn't pay to mess with Israel. They've discovered that the price is too high, that they just get, they, they get shredded. I mean, Egypt during the six day, during the six day war, the 70, I can't, 73 war, I can't remember which one, where, where, they, where Egypt went up with their planes and when they went back and the Jewish guys followed them and destroyed like three quarters of their air force in a, in a day. In other words, we're going to go attack Israel, ha, 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 ha. And by the time they get done, they were cut to pieces. Their military, their air force was absolutely destroyed. And by the way, their army that had come across the, the Sinai Peninsula as they're retreating, more of them died in the desert from water shortage than, than, than the Jewish military took out. So it's as if God was fighting against these nations. Well, that's exactly what he's describing. Except he's also saying that it's coming to a point where all the nations of the earth would be gathered against Jerusalem. That has not happened ever. So we have two choices. We can either allegorize it, but I have no idea what you would make it. Or you can say it just hasn't happened yet. It's still in the future. It's still coming. In that day, I will make... Wait a minute. Why doesn't it say shepherds? Why did he choose now to say governors? Because the leaders in Israel today aren't the religious leaders. They're, sec they're civil. Wow, isn't that interesting that even the choice of word for the leaders has changed? Hmm. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Have you, did you see the political cartoon? It's a political cartoon that shows Benjamin Netanyahu holding up a shield, like this, holding up a shield. And it's peppered with darts, with, with missiles. Just, they're all over. And he's even got one stuck, stuck in his head. He's got a couple stuck in his leg. And he's got one missile in his left hand ready to throw. And in the cartoon, AOC and Tlaib are standing there saying, No, don't you throw that! <laughs> it's, just, it's so funny, you know. But... but um, uh, how interesting this description in the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves. I mean, they're, they're iron dome. We just had a test. Um, the U.S. just had a test out in the South Pacific of a missile defense system, and it failed. We need to go ask the Jews for their help because they've made it work very effectively. And uh, how, how ironic. So he says, Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Why would he even say that? He was back in Jerusalem when he wrote this. Huh. It will be inhabited again in her own place because he was prophesying to a time on the far side of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem 
to a time yet in the future, in the distant future, as it turns out. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. Now, again, I can't tell you all that that means, except I believe that it's really going to be that way. There's going to be distinction enough, and there's a reason for it, even though we don't see it yet. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. So at this point, he's describing God protecting them. But we're going to find out pretty soon, a little further on, he's going to talk about them being taken by the city of Jerusalem, one more time being attacked, and two-thirds of them being destroyed. So, uh, But at this point, he's talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem and them being protected by God. Interesting. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Huh. And that has essentially been exactly the case of what's going on right now. now. I don't know that that's the final fulfillment of this, but for the time being, that seems to be where we're at. Now, he goes on, he says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In order for this to be true, you have to have inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they need to be Jewish people, national Israel, and that's what we have today. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. All right, now. So the reference to the one who is pierced, we know who that is, right? There's no doubt about that part. So again, in the midst of this prophecy, we have these literal statements about Jesus that were literally fulfilled. But the question is, is did the city, as a city, mourn for Jer mourn the mourning in Jerusalem? Did they mourn for Christ at his crucifixion? Well, the disciples mourned, but it was a tiny little group, 120 people. So the city did not. So in other words, when it talks about this great mourning, and then it goes on for several verses and describes this family and that family and these people and the wives by themselves, and it goes into great detail describing this mourning, saying, well, that mourning hasn't happened yet. So what is this great mourning? Well, it happens when they look on him whom they've pierced. Well, that's Jesus. So is the people, are the people of Jerusalem right now looking on Jesus as their Messiah, the one whom they've pierced? Not even close. Yes, Lisa? Uh-huh. Where there's a Messianic rabbi in Israel who used this exact passage to witness to a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi with a congregation of over 600 people uh -huh. and his wife. I mean, there's a picture of them standing there on the street while he's witnessing to them. And he used this verse, and he said, so who did they pierce? You know, did they pierce Moses? Did they pierce David? You yes, know, yes, who did they yes. pierce? And, and he's getting, well, this, this isn't a Jewish message. He said, well, look, it's right here in Zechariah. And he showed him the passage, took him to Psalms 22 and a bunch of other passages, Isaiah and uh, in the end, he was extremely shook up. His wife was, on the other hand, very interested and in saying, it's in the scriptures. You know, she's saying it's in the scriptures, and he knows who he's talking about. And, and so then he says, well, that name, and of course he's referring to Jesus, that's not in the scriptures. And, he, and then he showed him verses... Where it is. Where it is in the scriptures, because the word salvation is Jesus, and there are scriptures where, that say it my God has become my salvation, my Yeshua. Uh -huh. and, and he was extremely shaken up, ended up taking his contact information because he does Bible studies with people. Interesting. So anyway, it was interesting that he used this exact passage to start his witnessing. Nice, nice. One month from today, uh, one month from today, one month from this Sunday, basically, first Sunday of July, we, if uh, Southwest Airlines doesn't throw us off, we intend to try and be back in Michigan with our, our kids for a week. And um, so Jim will be bringing the morning message. And for the Sunday school hour, I have a video by, um, I think that you're going to really enjoy, by some of these Messianic Jews, um, one for Israel people. They have some 
fascinating, fascinating uh, information for you, and I think you'll really enjoy that. So, But it is very interesting to make these connections. They've used the Internet to get the word to their own people because talking to them on the street has been so difficult. Three-tenths of one percent of the Jewish people in Israel believe in Jesus as their Messiah. Three-tenths of one percent. Think of that. So there's going to be great mourning in Jerusalem in Zechariah, we learn. In John chapter 19, uh, we find this description after the crucifixion. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So we know that, so when John uses that reference and he ties it to, to, to Zechariah's prophecy, and he ties it to Jesus, we know there's no mistake about what's what. Now we go to Revelation 1.7. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye... Now, in Hebrew, the, the tenses are not obvious, but in Greek, they're extremely obvious. This is future tense when it says, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Those are future tense. So... John writing Revelation, most scholars believe, not Reformed theologians, but most scholars believe, or not some of the Reformed theologians, most scholars believe John wrote in about 90 A.D., 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem point in time. He's talking about something even further in the future that has not yet happened. And he says, there, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, reference to the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. And so when you tie that together with what we read in Zechariah, that they're going to mourn when they see the one whom they pierced and they realize, you're kidding, you mean for 2,000 years we missed our Messiah? Yes, that's really what it means. So Zechariah 13, he goes on, he says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Now this is a, a kind of a summary statement again about Jesus' crucifixion. Says the Lord of hosts, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. We know that's referring to the disciples. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, Yahweh is my God. Now, we, again, we can look at that and say, well, it goes back to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, so maybe it's talking about the two-thirds are the ones destroyed with the destruction of Rome, uh, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And it could be. If that's true, then it's talking about national Israel. Right? I mean, if, if we're going to do that, if we're going to say that the two-thirds that are destroyed were the ones destroyed in 70 AD, which it could be, then what we're saying is that that's national Israel. So then can you take the one-third that's left and say they're no longer national Israel? Now we're talking about Christians? I don't see any way you can do that. And so he says he's going to take the one-third that's left and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. And they will call in my name and I will answer them and I will say, this is my people. And each one of them will say, Yahweh is my God. Now, in fact, I believe that the two-thirds being destroyed will happen during the tribulation period. But either way you take it, you still end up with the same problem if you don't accept this as being literally national Israel that's being referred to. Because either way, you've, you've got to figure out what to do with the two-thirds that's destroyed. And they're either destroyed at the time of the Roman uh, sacking of the city, or they're destroyed at a future point. And be, based on texts in the book of Revelation, we believe it's at a future point. Zechariah continues, he says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and, I, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Has this happened? Not even close. This has not been fulfilled. The city shall be taken, the houses... Remember I said earlier he was going to defend Jerusalem. And guess what? Right now, he has been defending them. If you watch this, those, those uh, videos made by the Greenspan guy, Michael Greenspan... What he, you know, he has all these, he went there as a skeptic, but there's all these stories of the Jewish people being miraculously protected 
in battles that they fought. It's like, what? How come this is happening? It's because God is with them right now. But apparently, there's a time coming when he's going to gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off in the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, half of it toward the south. And we go a few verses further. And in that day, it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. This is so funny because what is the one thing that Jerusalem does not have? It's a pit, any sort, reasonable source of water. They've got the little spring of Gihon, you know. It's, it's one of the things that they have always... I mean, it's, this, it's a city that no one would choose in modern time to make that a center of anything. Because there's no, there, there, it's naturally speaking, other than the fact that it's up. I mean, what do you do when you have a city and no water? Well, we can talk about that. We got California, <laughs> right? And not much water. But when this, when when Christ returns, plants his feet in the Mount of Olives, splits it, and there's going to be a river flowing east and a river flowing west. And by the way, the descriptions here and the descriptions in Ezekiel and the description in, in Revelation 21 talk about the the Dead Sea being brought back to life. And talks about people fishing. And, and in, the, in Revelation 22, it talks about the tree of life growing alongside of, the, of this river of life. And uh, it, it, it's, I'm out of time. <sighs> the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Oh, that's when the Lord will be king. When he comes and plants his feet in the Mount of Olives, destroys the enemies that are attacking the city of Jerusalem. And then he will be king. He says, Behold, in, oh, now Joel's prophecy, behold in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage. Because national Israel has always been God's symbol. God has always held, even during the time that they're in chastisement, they still serve as an illustration for all the world of how God deals with his chosen people. But he says, I will bring, gather the nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment on them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Wow. Come, go down, for the wine press is full. Where do, we, where do we run into these exact expressions? The book of Revelation. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. The, in the valley of decision, the sun and moon will grow dark. Stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will roar from where? Zion, that's Jerusalem. And utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem all shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains will drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord." And we see that again, we see that in Revelation. Same terminology is used and described. Brethren, it's, it's, it's not, we, we don't have to allegorize it, we just have to realize it just hasn't happened yet. It's still coming. And the pieces are coming together right now like never before. And it's a pretty exciting time to be alive. And I would love to take you to 1 Thessalonians and show you why you can be encouraged, but I don't have to because we're out of time. So pretty amazing, the description. And the same description, the great wine press of the wrath of God. The wine press was trampled outside the city. Wow, it's, the, it's that battle. Not the battle of Armageddon. This is a separate battle. Battle of Armageddon most likely has already happened before the tribulation begins or at the beginning of it. This is separate. Wow, pretty exciting times, I'd say. And uh, I was going to take you to 1 Thessalonians so you could see that we, we don't have to be discouraged because we're not appointed for wrath. 
The wrath of God is on the nations who, at the, we believe, and I might have a graphic here again. Let me see if I have a graphic here. Yeah, these are the ones that talk about not being appointed to wrath. It's too late. We'll do that another time. All right. Let's round up the troops and be back in about eight minutes, okay? Thank you.